So, welcome everybody to our second solutions workshop. Uh, this is the Resilient Waters Solutions webinar series. Today we are talking about dikes and fish passage. Uh, and with that, if you're so if you're not into dikes and you're not into fish passage, then you might be in the wrong place. Um, but hopefully you're in the right place. So with that, uh, let's just get rolling. So I'll start by saying we are most of us are on the lands of the mainland Coast Salish First Nations people. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Chief Harley Chapel to uh, give us a welcome today. Good morning, everybody. Am I on screen? Oh yeah, there we go. Um, I, just, my, I, I was always taught that we, we try to do our best to open meetings the best way we understand. Uh, we say, CM and Estrella to CM, Hopakton and Sisna, Haichka CM Makwelia to Asla Atia Swaya. I just want to thank the people for being here. You know, we, we always try to, you know, it's very, very difficult in these times to to gather in, in, in person. And, and obviously, webinars is the, the way we're going about doing things and for the foreseeable future. But just to be able to, kind of calm your mind. My, my one relative would always say, take a few breaths and just just bring yourself to the present because we need you here and now, we need you present. And, um, and all he says is, is say these few words so that it, we collect our mind, body, spirit and, and, and that we're able to do good work in a good way. So in that, I'll just say a quick little um, welcome and then we'll go from there. Ochito CM, please to skepsit, a quam comcha, talita sal squalawal, quam quali, tal til talawail, a quas haukalasit, to see was to see alakwa, chitamitsit, lam comixtam, a quas Great spirit, I ask you to come down and bless each and every one of us for what we're about to sit and discuss. Remind us of our teachings of honor and respect. And with that, I say all my relations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harley. Um, and because I forgot to mention it, Harley is uh, chief of, uh, of Semiamu First Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you so much for that welcome. Uh, yes, taking some time to take a breath um, and really be present in this moment is so important. Uh, I particularly want to take a moment to acknowledge the hundreds of years of colonialism and systemic racism and their ongoing effects that are harming First Nations and particularly the overlapping crises of uh, flooding of communities and cultural sites, the loss of salmon, and now COVID. Uh, the systems that have been designed to control water and flooding are born of a similar settler mentality that was designed to control indigenous and black lives, the same ones that forcefully and with violence often displaced and bounded First Nations onto reserves, purposefully in harm's way on floodplains. The snapshot shows uh, reserve lands in the lower Fraser uh, overlapped with uh, 1999 floodplain data. And this is not just true of the lower Fraser, it's true in many areas of the world. Uh, this is the same mentality and systemic racism that saw to it that black people were by far the most impacted, abandoned, and criminalized when the levee broke in New Orleans in 2004. And those with us last week might remember my reference of Danielle Purifoy's statement about the stubborn whiteness of environmentalism. What I didn't tell you is that her inspiration to continue her education in environmental justice was not the joy of academia, but working with black women and mentors in New Orleans for a more fair and just recovery. And I know I'm taking up a lot of space to say all this, but I take this space because what I'm hearing from indigenous people is that some of us white settler people are eager to move on to reconciliation and are quick to skip uncomfortable truths. Uh, this is our history too. This is a settler history uh, and it's a shameful one. Uh, and it is not enough just to sit in uncomfortable truths. We also need to take action. So on behalf of our project and on behalf of me as an individual, we are listening and learning about how best to do uh, that and take action and acknowledge these truths on the lower Fraser and do our best to make those efforts genuine and not tokenizing or performative, but transformative, hopefully. Uh, white people have a lot to do 
to work on in this area, and I'm open to conversations or to help coordinate future workshops on anti-racism and environmental work if that suits others. Uh, so please feel free to get in touch with ideas or feedback if you're interested in that. And uh, thank you for giving me the space to share that. So getting right into it, uh, let's talk a little bit about the webinar flow and a little bit of housekeeping. I'll be giving a little bit of an update from Resilient Waters. I'll speed along this because many of you were probably at the workshop last week uh, on last Friday. We'll have 10 minute presentations from each speaker uh, and then we'll have a Q&A panel discussion. That seemed to work pretty well for us last week. I'll quickly just go over a few things about using Zoom today. Our meter meeting is being recorded right now. Uh, if you want to, you're welcome to rename yourself uh, under the participants tab. Uh, you can go and find your name, uh, click on the more and add your organization or just your title or your whatever you would like. In the chat box, uh, I'd welcome you all. I know that this is not the most um, interactive engagement uh, and ideally that we would be able to do that, but uh, because we have so many speakers, um, I think what is most useful is if you're welcome to repeat things that you like that speakers are saying in the chat box, share URLs and other resources, uh, ask quick clarifying questions and tech support, uh, and you're even welcome to have cheeky private side chats, one of those uh, secret luxuries of, of Zoom that a room wouldn't let you have. So you can find <laughs> you can find this uh, participants uh, little box and the chat box in your little Zoom window down there. And then the little thing we'll be collecting questions and answers using the Slido again. Uh, and if you go to Slido.com and enter the code Salmon, you'll be able to start asking questions, and you can really start doing that at any time. So quickly, before we get on to the next bit, I just want to launch a little poll here to just see who is in the room with us today. So please just take a moment to click on what organization you're from. The answers are streaming in. We're almost all there. Great, so there we go. Okay, so we have a pretty even mixture of folks from across different governments. Uh, the nonprofit is is uh, leading the leading uh, First Nations. There we go. So it's pretty even split of people in the room today. So that's pretty great to see. So. Just a very quick thing about Resilient Waters. I know a lot of you have probably heard about this already. So Resilient Waters is a relatively new project, started in uh, October of 2019. Uh, it is a project of what is now uh, Makeway, uh, formerly Tides Canada. Um, and if you don't know what Makeway or Tides Canada is, I will add a uh, some links to find out more about that in the chat here right now. Uh, but I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, so we are basically supporting opportunities to improve flood control infrastructure along the lower Fraser from Richmond to Hope uh, to allow fish passage. Uh, and then with that extra dual purpose of restoring that habitat and migration routes for salmon and also helping to prepare communities for flooding. Uh, and so we are working with Kerwood Lydell Consulting Engineers and uh, Pearson Ecological. Um, and this project is really, oh, and I should say, we are funded by the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, as well as uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation. And much of our work is informed by and uh, inspired by uh, work of Watershed Watch Salmon Society and uh, the Connected Waters campaign that Lena Aziz runs. If you are interested in uh, some of the more kind of technical or governance or intersector perspectives that inform this project, you can go see a, uh, take a look at a report on a workshop that they hosted last June. Many of you might have even been participants of that workshop, but it's always worth another read because it's, uh, it's got a lot of that kind of juicy stuff. Um, 
Oh, and this is the part where I try to show you our real map this time. So last week I wasn't able to do it. This week I think I will be able to because I've preloaded it. So here we go. So if you do actually go to our website, uh, and I will quickly, or actually you can just grab this one. I will pop this one in the chat as well. This is a link to the map. You can also find it on our website, uh, resilientwaters.ca, if you ever lose track of it. And this has uh, basically summarizes a lot of what we've been working on for the last six or seven months through engagements uh, and, and collaboration and talking with folks, as well as doing some background research and, and making use of the knowledge that Patrick Lilly of Kerwood Lydell and Mike Pearson of Pearson Ecological uh, bring to the table with their 30 plus years of experience in, in fisheries in this area and water related infrastructure. Uh, we've narrowed down to 25 uh, pieces of flood infrastructure that are of a special interest along the Lower Fraser. Um, and you can go and click on any of these nice colorful little dots which signify our shortlist sites to find out a little bit more about them. Uh, we plan to keep this uh, map up to date and uh, continue to add opportunities as they arise. Um, so if you have any comments on these sites uh, or sites that aren't included here, then please do reach out to me uh, and we will <coughs> get the conversation going. Okay, back to the presentation. Here we go. Another fun little thing we're doing on the side is uh, is working on these uh, visualizations with UBC's Coastal Adaptation Lab, uh, at Case Lachman and a student, uh, uh, Nate Ross, uh, who is working on these visualizations for us and we're hoping to have all sorts of different kinds of flood infrastructure that demonstrates how they work or don't work for fish. Um, this is the dreaded top mount gate. Um, and so we'll continue to keep you posted as we create these visualizations. And then just a tiny little bit about why we are hosting a solutions workshop series. Uh, what we were realizing is that there's a little understanding of how well fish friendly or fish friendly uh, solutions are working. So we wanted to find out what other people are, are understanding about these solutions or, or the problem itself. Um, and basically to connect ourselves into a network of people working on this problem around the world and maybe even open up the uh, new innovative ways of doing it. So with that, I am going to hand it over to uh, Harley once more. And I will say, before Harley gets started, let me just where did it go? Sorry, everyone. I've got so many windows open. There we go. I will just say, uh, Harley is uh, elected chief at Semiamu First Nation in South Surrey, BC. Uh, he has recently been appointed to the Emergency Secretariat Leadership Table as a coastal rep and also sits on the Fraser Basin Council as a coastal First Nation. So thanks so much for being here today, Harley, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's Quichil. Um my, my traditional name is Hwapakton. My English name is Harley Chapel. I am very, very grateful and, and thankful to be here today. You know, we've been, I've been pretty neck deep in flood and, and dikes and, and conversations over the past year. Um, you know, really, it, it started with a conversation with with Fraser Basin Council and and in their flood mitigation plan and and how are First Nations being involved in that and and what are the roles of, of Aboriginal rights and title within within that scope of work and looking at that flood mitigation in in the lower Fraser you know and, and it really it, it sparked as was mentioned from Dan we um we and ignited the emergency secretariat and um, and the, the biggest piece for that was to bring indigenous worldview to the table and, and bring indigenous communities voice and, and, and obviously rights and title. But you know, where, where I see the, 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 the crossover happen 
is, and, and I say worldview, and, and I'm going to explain that a little bit, and I'm not going to take a lot of time. And I'm going to say I'm glad, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to go first. I got to get this over with so that I can go get my teeth worked on this morning. And now that the dentists are back open. And uh, so my day isn't getting any better. Uh, this is the best part of it. Um, but, you know, really, the it was a conversation with one of my colleagues, Tyrell Tribal Council. The, the suggestion to the Fraser Bailin is to our emergency secretary is, is to look at salmon habitat and, and what is the correlation between flood and, and how are we using the, the opportunity that we have to mitigate and, and protect obviously human infrastructure and homes and communities, but at the same time be able to keep in mind. The, the work that we need to do has that ripple effect on, on other aspects of, of our beings, whether that's communities up or down the, the Fraser or along the coastline, but as well as the, our, our relatives that are in the, in the water. And, and what are we doing to, to keep that in mind? And, how, and that's definitely a, something we will be able to navigate and something we will be able to continue to work towards to allow for, you know, the 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 Fraser River sockeye that's that's at risk, the Fraser River um, spring salmon, whatever you what everybody else calls them, um, all these things that we 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 keep in mind, and I say that's the world view. You know, a lot of the times what we found was flood mitigation is just build the wall, build the wall, and and we kind of joke and we say, well, if we build the wall all along the Fraser River. It, it's going to have huge detrimental impacts to, to salmon and salmon habitat. It's going to have, we're, we're basically going to create a water slide and the water slide will shoot out to the mouth, which is already at risk. And, and our relatives that sit at the mouth in, in Musqueam territory, what are the impacts that happen there? You know, I'm going to speak a little bit today about, about some of the Living Dyke project that's going on in South Surrey. We're partner with, um, with the city of Surrey and city of Delta. To, to come together on a major DMAF application that went through last year. And, and, and really, I, 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 I'll speak to that because I think a lot of the people online, it, it's, it's quite important that we realize that, and I heard it loud and clear one, one, one trip we made to Ottawa was, if we can have municipalities and First Nations partnering and, and bringing that, that regional benefit for infrastructure projects and infrastructure um, needs in the area, that gets a lot of attention at, 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 in Ottawa. So I, I wanted to say that right away because I know that, you know, historically a lot of First Nations haven't had the best relationships with neighboring municipalities, haven't had any relationships. And, you know, being able to open those lines of communication will do nothing but benefit all of the above. And when it comes to, to to uh, flood mitigation or, or salmon habitat or restoration. And, and I say that because in, in part of the, the project that we're doing with the Living Dyke project in, in South Surrey is, you know, we're looking at, at bivalves, clam, shellfish, uh, mussels, uh, crab habitat, salmon habitat. And, and what is that project going to do to, oh, better or worse, um, the the future impacts and un unfortunately given the give, sorry i gotta move a little bit here I'm, I'm dying my power's dying already um what are we doing to to enhance that that salmon habitat and the the, the overall well-being of the of our of our boundary in samuel bay and I, I think that's an important piece and and i it always kind of brings me back to one little comment that was made at, at our, our flood our flood um, forum that we had in Vancouver, and several different municipalities from across the lower Fraser sitting in one room, First Nations communities and, and Fraser Basin Council hosting. And, you know, I said a lot of the times we talk about culturally sensitive sites, which are, are and, you know, and you can kind of see people kind of, oh yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I said, I'm just gonna pose a question to the municipalities that are in the room. We, we talk about culturally sensitive sites, whether that being 
petroglyphs or or fishing spots or or, or harvesting areas. I said, but I want you to you to think about your municipality and think where is your graveyard in 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 your municipality? Is it below the floodplain? And and how would your constituents feel if if that was at risk? And and that you kind of started to see some of the side chatter that went on. And and I I really said so if we're looking at it from that lens, we're all in the same situation. And and you know and for us to be able to parallel the, the worldviews of, okay, m mitigation and planning for infrastructure and, and municipal protection. Fantastic. Everybody needs that. But also, how do we use these opportunities to enhance salmon habitats, enhance foreshore, enhance, I see someone um, later on in the presentation from Okanagan, enhance the, the shoreline along the lakes and the rivers. How are we doing that? And what are we doing to incorporate that perspective from, from our lens? Because unfortunately, a lot of the times it's not there. And, and I, I feel that that's the, the worldview that a lot of the First Nations communities will bring to the table is what are we doing? And, and definitely with the assistance and the help of, of Resilient Waters here and, and bringing that mindset to, we know there's an issue. We know that we're at risk yearly and uh, you know, for us on the coast, it's it's creeping up to the doorstep as we speak, and all all across the coast. So, what are we doing to enhance that and and keep in mind the the ecosystems and the uh, I always say our relatives in the water, and and their well being because that that is us. We are that that is us. You know, in in our history and our culture, it's in Simiamo specifically, we our our elders tell us Shasha Hualaksan. Uh, we are we are the survivors of the flood. Our, our our origin comes from the great flood that that was in this area. You know, and when we talk about that, uh, upwards of ten thousand years ago, we are the survivors of that flood, and we've always been able to adapt. And we've always been able to to be able to relocate if if possible. And and, and unfortunately, that's not the world that we live in these days. You know, I, I always speak to, um, I, I always keep two communities in mind in particular. Well, I guess there's three or four, but I, I, I speak of two that are right on the lower Fraser of Cape and Kwantlen. And, and they have islands, their reserve properties are on island or, or right along the, the Fraser River. And I said, if that island is deemed to be uninhabitable in the next 50 years, where are we going? What are we doing? How are we relocating? And, and for us as First Nations communities, and obviously some of the process that we need to go through, um, through ISC fund, Indigenous Services funding, through through the funding channels that we're able to access, it, it, it's quite challenging. So it does spark a different conversation for First Nations communities. If we are at risk and, and with sea level rise, yep, okay, I see one minute, I'm getting the hook, perfect. Um, you know, I, I think it, it does bring a different conversation and, and a different frame of thought that we need to we need to protect our our traditional food sources we need to protect our communities obviously same as all the municipalities and provincial and federal governments that are in on the call here but we also need to and and may possibly mean need to begin discussions on relocations relocations of reserve lands and that's um you know and the other the other the last thing i'll, I'll close off on is you know, given the municipalities and tax bases, we know the the opportunities that, that you know, I, I'm working with Surrey, which is a very large municipality and has, a, a, I'll say, some clout in, in the area because of the, the, the vast size of it and the issues. And then very fortunate to be have that good conversation and good relationship with them to be able to sit down and say, we need to protect this. this these are our aspects of, of this disaster mitigation application that we need to have implemented in the plan so i know i could go on forever i my mind thinks of, of flooding and diking and and uh but there is the the living dike if you want more information it's it's on the surrey uh city of surrey website it as part of their disaster mitigation application funding um and one of the projects that we're partnered with so if you want more information about it and and i didn't realize i was just on the call yesterday about it and i didn't realize it was very very new and inventive and creative and it's new technology that's coming into into canada i guess it's used a little bit more in the states but um 
it, it's I'm, I'm proud to be part of that discussion. Thank you very much. I'm going to check off as soon as, and I'm, unfortunately, it, I'll just leave this, Dan. If if anybody has any questions or anything, by all means, you can fire off my email to anybody if, if there is anything from there. Thank you. Have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy your almost summer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, yeah, that was a very helpful perspective you're sharing there. Um, and I hope you have a good time at the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Well, have a good time. So you, Harley won't be able to join us for the Q&A, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I will pass along your email yes. when I follow up with this uh, post, post session. So thanks very much. Thank you. I will uh, now introduce Sarah Nathan of Ducks Unlimited while she uh, gets her presentation ready and her screen shared. So all her life, Sarah Nathan has greatly enjoyed watching wildlife so it's not surprising that she pursued a career in habitat restoration in the nonprofit sector. Sarah is a registered professional biologist with the College of Applied Biology in BC. She is currently the acting manager of provincial operations for Ducks Unlimited Canada, uh, where she has worked as a habitat restoration biologist since June 2016. Thanks, Sarah. And I'm just unmuting you. There we ah. go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Let me just go back into presentation mode. <laughs> Here we go. There we are. Sorry about that. Um, I keep myself on mute because it's a little noisy in my neighborhood, so I don't really want that filtering into the discussion uh, when uh, not needed. So, um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dan. And, and I also, unfortunately, have to leave for a different meeting at 11, um, but feel free to circulate my email address to anyone who's interested in, in asking any further questions. Um, so Ducks Unlimited is, is really a, a very much a boots on the ground kind of organization. Um, we are, you know, we deliver habitat work and, and we work with a wide variety of partner agencies and communities. Um, to secure habitat for conservation. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about two dike breach projects that we're working on under our Coastal Restoration Fund program with DFO. Um, it'll be the Woodward and Frenchies Islands works. So Woodward is an upcoming project that we're gonna deliver in the winter of 2021. And Frenchies Island actually has a bit of an interesting history. It, it's a previous dike breach project that's resulted in quite a monoculture of invasive plants. And we're doing a lot of interesting work on, on learning about uh, uh, invasive European cattail on that site, um, which has ended up colonizing that site as a result of, of management over the years, uh, culminating with the dike breach. So I'm gonna start talking with talking about Woodward and then I'll move into Frenchies and, and I'll, I'll hopefully keep it within the eight to 10 minute time frame. So just for a bit of context, um, the red and yellow polygons on this map show um, DUC conservation interests in, in the lower mainland, basically. So these polygons aren't lands that DUC owns, um, but they're lands that are set aside for conservation under some sort of an agreement. And you'll see the farm fields there. So DUC, you know, obviously our focus species over the years has been waterfowl. We do do salmon enhancement work too, but, but you know, is right in our name, our primary species group that we're funded to, to manage for is, is waterfowl. So the reason those farm fields are outlined, especially there in the Delta area, is that um, those involve cover crop agreements, so a, a fall planting of crops to feed waterfowl that are coming through. And that would be most interesting to this group. Um, the application to salmon is that um, snow geese are, are hyper abundant right now in, our, in the lower Fraser. Um, and so keeping cover crop on the landscape does benefit salmon conservation by, by providing an additional food source for snow geese other than marsh plants. So it helps reduce the damage uh, to marsh by snow geese. Um, otherwise, we have a wide variety of different partners that we work with and different sort of habitat securement agreement contexts. So some of these polygons are wildlife management areas with the province. Some of them are municipally owned parks. Some of them, like I said, are farm fields. Um, but they're all lands that are that have a long term conservation interest on them. Um, and, and we basically, for Ducks Unlimited's perspective, we won't deliver a big project unless we know it's going to stay on the landscape. So, so hence those long conservation agreements that are, that are on those parcels. Um, all right, so I'll give some context to the areas I'm going to talk about. So this is the South Arm Marshes Wildlife Management Area. 
um, located in the Fraser River South Arm, um, West of Island being to the southwest there and, and Delta to the south and then Richmond is, is immediately north. Um, the south arm of the Fraser is at the north end there um, and you can see some of the little tankers that are little in this image but quite large in, in reality. Um, I've named the different islands uh, here. So Woodward Island is, is subject to the restor one of the restoration projects that I'm going to talk about one of the dig regions. Um, circled in red is Frenchies Island. Um, I'll show a zoomed in graphic of it later in the presentation when I speak of it in more detail. It's, it's quite small. It's a two hectare little island in there. Um, but just for a bit of background, um, you'll notice Rose Kirkland and Gun Williamson Islands, um, there's active farming on those. So those are historically farmed areas. Um, and one of the things that drove the interesting changes on Frenchies was that it was also previously farmed. So um, that's just for a little bit of background before we get to Frenchies. But I'm gonna start the discussion with Woodward. Um, so you'll see, I hope you can see my cursor. There's quite a big amount of marsh habitat here. We've got um, two training structures. So the blue one is what's known as the Woodward Training Wall, and this yellow line is, is called the Woodward Dam. And so these were built in the early 1900s, I believe completed in around 1920, um, for the purpose of training the Fraser for shipping. So again, we've got a, a hard riprap wall here that connects to a similar hard riprap wall on the outside of Rose Kirkland. And this helps channelize the Fraser, um, helping for, for moving large tankers. Obviously not that helpful for fish, uh, Harley was referring to it in his in his presentation as a as a water slide, and I'd heard someone else previously refer to this as as sort of a highway or or like a super highway. And so what we're trying to do with Woodward um, is we're trying to get some little off ramps so that juvenile salmon, juvenile chinook in particular, can get off the big highway and enter all of this marsh habitat. Um, so, so yeah, ultimately we're looking at a couple of breaches kind of in this area, and and one of the big things that we're having to balance is is keeping this marsh habitat here without kind of blowing it out because, and I'll go to my next slide here, because the, that marsh habitat developed over time in response to that training wall being there. So that, that's actually kind of an interesting little bit of history and, and I'll credit Northwest Hydraulics for the following three slides. So this was from a contract that we had them do. So Northwest Hydraulics is a hydrodynamic modeling expert consulting firm that's done a ton of work in the Fraser. So, they did some aerial photo gathering and looked at how, you know, and I believe there's actually someone's PhD thesis um, showing how these training structures in the Fraser really influenced habitat that's now been available. So you can see 1932 is the earliest slide up in the top left hand corner there. And you can see there's not actually that much marsh there. There is some. Um, and then, and, and I guess the blue lines, just to give a little bit of an explanation, the blue lines are there just to give you kind of a sense of, of where you're looking. Um, so, you know, that, that blue lines are the same in each image. So if you move over to 1946, you see now this blue line at the top is very consistent with the dam and the training wall. There's been additional marsh development. B and C are just kind of little areas that, that have been circled um, for reference. Um, and they're circled because they're, op they're, they're sort of remaining open water areas right now. Move down to 79, we've got even more marsh development, which kind of, kind of has started to level off kind of around this time. And then the recent or more recent imagery from 2017 shows more or less what we've got in there now. So you see how much that's filled in over the years. Um, and so there's actually kind of an interesting philosophical question here, which is that, um, you know, this habitat was not here in the first place. It, it exists in response to a training structure. However, now that it is here, you know, there's probably good reason to keep it. It's not like we have an overabundance of marsh habitat in the Fraser, given the industrial and residential pressures on the area. Um, and so, so really this habitat, even though it, it is actually anthropogenically influenced, it is, is probably valuable and really worth protecting. Um, so we'll just go to our next slide. So this is uh, an existing breach in the Woodward Dam. Um, I'll show you in the following slide where exactly this breach is located. So this is about a two meter wide breach where, where there is already a, a, like a limited amount of fish passage into the area. And, um, this breach was actually built, I believe, by hand um, by a um, rogue conservation person who um, I believe with some pals probably 20 or 30 years ago went in there and, and started moving riprap. Um, 
I shall keep him nameless because I would not want this person to, um, you know, get some flack at this point in his life. But, uh, but yeah, so this, this was made by, by this person who has been sort of hunting and fishing in the South Arm Marshes um, for, the, for the past 70 years or so. So someone who's, who's, you know, been on the ground for a long time and really kind of watched some of the changes. Um, and so when we worked with NHC on, on trying to figure out where and how many breaches we could safely make to the Woodward Dam and or training wall in order to create some fish passage without blowing out the marsh, NHC came in here and they took this picture and, and used this as sort of a template of, of what might happen if, if there were more breaches and, and where they could be. So this is again a two meter base width breach. Um, allowing some fish, fish passage fish passage through the, uh, the Woodward uh, Dam. So this is a LIDAR map. This is from Fraser Basin Council originally is where the data came from. Um, and NHC grabbed this and, and has used it to develop their modeling to, to look at stuff for us. And so one, two, and three, the numbers on there indicate where we're, we're going to be creating some breaches, um, obviously subject to permitting and stuff. And we've had a few stakeholder meetings with permitting agencies and, and must be in First Nation and, and a few other conservation interests here. Um, but those were sort of selected as areas where a breach would enable some fish passage, in particular because there is quite a bit of direct flow coming at the Woodward Dam, given the way the Fraser is shaped. Um, but these are not likely to make major impacts to the availability of marsh. Um, and that arrow just indicates where that existing little breach is. I see I've got one minute. So here's Frenchies Island. So the interesting story about Frenchies, it was previously farmed and in 08, um, DUC teamed up with DFO and we breached the dike in three places around here and dug some fish channels. And then we went away because the theory, uh, at least often in estuary restoration, is you know you remove the dike and things will restore. So yes and no. Um, the issue that happened at Frenchies is it became covered with a relatively new invasive plant, uh, European cattail. So this is a picture of, of Brad Mason, who was doing a bit of elevation surveys in here for us, um, paddling around. And basically the entire area is a typha and gustifolia or European cattail monoculture at this point. This is a map produced by Dan Stewart, who's a botany masters, uh, um, and he's looking specifically at the distribution and ecological niche of this plant in the Fraser. So this is a heat map showing where this plant all is. Um, and so basically be breaching dikes at this point in the Fraser, we just start thinking about invasive plants moving in and how those might be influencing the habitat. So we have a number of, of experiments going on under our CRF program to look at controlling this. And there's the gong. So this is just another picture of the typha um, with six foot four inch high Eric Bach standing um, being dwarfed by it. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, thanks Sarah. That was great. Nice little snapshot. And some good history. Um, and thanks for joining us, Sarah. I know you have to get going pretty soon, but uh, yeah. thanks very much for joining us for now. And uh, like you said, I, I will share your email um, with uh, my follow-up email to everyone if they have any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do I need to unshare my screen? Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in thumbnail mode all of a sudden Yeah, that's here. okay. I can take care of that. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. How do I? Yeah, I know how to do it. There we go. <laughs> Bingo. Thank you very much. I'll just mute myself again. Thanks. Okay, in the uh, meantime, I will introduce Jenna Freeble while she gets her uh, slide ready to go and sharing her screen. So Jenna Freeble works for the Skagit Drainage and Irrigation Districts Consortium, uh, where she focuses on improving irrigation water supply, drainage infrastructure, dike and levee protection, and improved environmental quality. She graduated from the University of Washington and has worked professionally for over 20 years as an engineer and hydrologist on projects ranging from hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, tidegate replacement, to large-scale estuary restoration projects, and committed to finding, she is committed to finding a balance between sustainable and healthy fisheries and local sustainable agriculture. Thanks for joining us, Jenna. Uh, Looking for okay. your share screen button. What's that? Uh, uh, sure. Do you see it? I don't think so. Oh, there we go. 
There we go. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll just, uh, we're located a little bit further south than the last talk in the Skagit River Delta. It's a large watershed. Um, it's one of the only or most glaciated watersheds in the lower 48 states. It actually extends up into Canada. So most of the work that I'm doing though is in the Delta. And you'll see this is where most of the population is located. Uh, the river bifurcates and we have a very large estuary. Um, it's mostly also agricultural. So this is just a conversation of balance really. And so there, it's um, one of the largest tributaries to Puget Sound, which is also part of the Salish Sea. I don't know why we call it Puget Sound. Um, and it's on the only US river that supports um, all native salmon and trout species with a huge population of um, fisheries. It's critical to the recovery of listed species in Puget Sound, so primarily the Chinook salmon. 60% of the Chinook salmon in Puget Sound come from the Skagit, so it's a really productive watershed for fisheries. Um, it's also a really productive um, location for agriculture. It's one of the most important industries in our county. It's also recognized worldwide um, as being um, a, a, a seed producer, so anybody that enjoys eating cabbage or beets. Uh, a lot of the world's seed supply comes from this valley. We have a really unique climate, um, but most of the agricultural land is subtidal, so it's below sort of the mean high tide line, which makes it really vulnerable to flooding um, and climate change. So just a little bit about our organization. Um, it's about 60,000 acres that we serve. It's a combination of 12 sort of special purpose districts. So we are almost the most local of all local governments that you can find. Um, we don't tax, we don't have political people involved, but uh, we do have land assessment. We have about 36 miles of levy. Um, so it starts around uh, the beginning of the Delta and extends most of the way to the Bay Front um, on two rivers to Skagit and the Samish. We also have about 21 miles of marine dike. So this uh, picture below sort of shows the interface between the farmland and the uh, marsh habitat. And uh, the, the narrow ribbon that separates those two is the marine dikes. Um, and then we also have about 65 sort of critical infrastructure locations, pumps, tide gates, and flood return. Uh, and it's part of, uh, they're just incorporated into the marine dike and levees as part of the infrastructure that we're, that we're responsible for managing. So this is just some examples of the, the tide gate structure that we have. Um, one of the things that I've inherited is very, very aging infrastructure. So they're, most of these are 30 to 50 years old. Almost all of them are in very poor condition. Most of them, like Dan's um, video, is uh, their top hinge gate, so they're not fish friendly. They're not actually very good for drainage either, is what we're finding out. So, so this is kind of what we're, we're looking at, uh, developing capital plans to start systematically replacing these structures. Uh, and what we're doing um, is investing in sort of these large uh, side hinge barn doors. And, and we don't have a lot of data in last year's session, last week's session was really interesting in how do we start evaluating fish benefits from these infrastructures. So this is an example of a tide gate structure that we built last summer. It replaced about eight side hinge or top hinge tubes um, from the previous slide with these big barn doors. So they're aluminum marine grade aluminum, they're very light. They don't require a lot of head or uh, differential across the structure. They don't have the pipe. So once they open, fish passage is significantly improved. It's also a lot better for drainage because the roughness coefficients are a lot lower um, and it allows for debris and sort of other things to pass through instead of getting hung up in sort of the um, top hinge gate. So these are really, um, sort of the way of the future, I think, for us, but I'd like to know better what other people are doing, pros and cons of this approach, and really is it improving habitat for fish, um, both for um, upstream migration of adults, but also for juveniles and just sort of that estuary interface. The other part of this is just uh, an example of what we're starting to struggle with with marine dike infrastructure. So most of this infrastructure was built around the end of the 1800s. It's well over 100 years old now. Um, it does protect all of the farmland in the Delta, um, but it's in pretty poor shape in a lot of places and it's starting to overtop. Um, this was, these pictures are taken from a 2016 flood event. 
where uh, we just had a very low barometric pressure and some wave setup. Um, the challenge is there's very limited funding for these types of improvements and, um, and very little understanding of what the climate change scenarios that we should be de designing to are in terms of changing wind patterns, um, subsidence, and um, height in terms of sea level rise. So we don't have a plan in place, but we're working to develop one to start systematically looking at this infrastructure. There's gonna be places where it makes sense to set it back uh, for habitat improvement um, and just sort of uh, changing weather pans, but there's gonna be places where it makes sense to rebuild the infrastructure where it is, and we don't have a good understanding of that yet. So this is, uh, these are just some photos uh, from a large scale habitat project that I was part of a couple of years ago. This is from 2017, where we did a setback levy. It's about a mile of setback levy uh, in a location that was really good for a uh, salmon habitat. So there are 131 acres of habitat that went along with this. So this just shows you sort of the complexity of what an engineered levy looks like. There are definitely uh, changes have been made since the late 1800s. <laughs> geotextile fabrics, geotextile base, we have a lot of rock armoring. Uh, they're higher, they're wider, um, they're expensive. Uh, this dike was designed for sea level rise. And what you'll see out in front of the dike um, is high marsh grading. So we kept all of the material on site. And one of the things that we are experimenting with is building marsh out in front of these setback levees to help reduce wave um, interaction and help provide more diverse uh, habitat so that you have a gradient from marsh down to tidal uh, mud flats instead of just having the waves crashing directly onto the new setback levee. Um, so this was a partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and NOAA, which is our national fisheries uh, agency. Um, and then, so then this is one of the infrastructures that our organization would take on long, long term O&M of um, now that it's been constructed and completed. Um, and so one of the things that Dan asked me to talk about a little bit is challenges and I'll just finish the presentation on that. Um, we are having a lot of trouble with this uh, transfer of institutional knowledge and so a lot of the drainage district commissioners that I work with. <clears throat> There's um, they're like in their 70s, 80s, we had one guy finally retire at 94. So we've been on the landscape for 60 years um, in these roles and they just intuitively understand the drainage and the habitat. Um, and so it's trying to bridge that institutional knowledge to um, engineering and design practices. Um, we, we are trying um, to, to better understand the sort of the living dike idea. There's not a lot of guidelines for that or um, publications for design manuals who can rely on the core of engineers um, but that doesn't really help us with the climate change and the design um, of the habitat features so that's something that we're trying to figure out um, moving forward and also just <clears throat> where on the landscape it makes sense to continue to fortify these levees and where on the landscape it makes sense to start setting the levees back and how do we do that um, so a lot of financial challenges with this work. So it was about uh, $9 million to construct a mile of setback levy. And so to think that we could do that for the 21 and a half miles of the levy that's falling apart is way beyond um, our financial capacity. So we're looking for sort of strategic partnerships uh, to help um, balance that, the investments for protection of, of the communities that we serve. Um, and then there's just a lot of um, lacking of site specific um, climate change impacts. And so we are um, sort of still on a glacier rebound. So that our land is actually moving up, but it's unclear what, what that long-term projection is. And then it's unclear to understand sort of um, how sea level rise is going to change. And then also just um, changing wind patterns. So we are noticing a change in, um, the direction of the wind and that's sort of hitting the dikes in different directions and causing erosion and overtopping because of waves and places that were never exposed to that as well and so that's something that we'll be looking again to partner with researchers um, and federal and federal and local agencies to better understand um, again where the where the investments are most productive and where um, where we're where, where we're going to fail so that we can start planning for that too. 
Um, it's, it's a short overview of what we're doing in this gadget, and I'd really like to open up the conversation after this presentation um, as a way to better understand what other people are doing in sort of the subtitle Delta interface. Thank you. Not used to Zoom, so this is a more traditional. Thanks so much, Jenna. That was great. Yeah, really helpful to learn about uh, work going on so close to us and uh, kind of a sister river to us. Yeah, and definitely the conversation is uh, hasn't quite begun on Slido. So if you are, if some questions are burning for you, then I encourage you to head over to that link in Slido and start answering your questions. You can also upvote the questions that you would most like to see answered by our uh, by our panel. Also just take a minute to say that there's also a uh, an ideas section when you go to visit that Slido link uh, and there is a place where you can put in your big takeaways from our presentation so if you'd like to put those in. All right with that I will uh, introduce uh, Danica Van Prustige. Uh, while she gets her presentation ready to roll. Danica Van Proustige is a coastal geomorphologist and professor at St. Mary's University, applying 25 years of experience in coastal ecosystem response to natural and human drivers of change to the restoration of tidal wetland habitat and design of nature-based climate change adaptation strategies. In collaboration with CBWES, Inc. She recently founded Transcoastal Adaptations Center for Nature-Based Solutions at SMU, and she is most happy slogging through the mud and paddling in the Bay of Fundy. Thanks for being here today, Danica. Oh, we're having, there okay. we go. There we go, okay. Thank you very much. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of Returning the Tides uh, for Nature-Based Climate Adaptation Marsh Restoration. And this is work that is that I'm not doing in isolation, very long collaboration with CB Wetlands Environmental Specialists, as well as the Departments of Agriculture and Departments of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. But before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that our work takes place in Mi'kma'ki, and the, that's the ancestor, ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And in fact, many of the areas that we're actually trying to restore were once used extensively by our indigenous, um, our indigenous populations. In the Bay, our work is situated on the east coast of Canada. Um, the Bay of Fundy is between the provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and has a long history of, of diking, starting from the Acadian settlers, planters, and then more modern agricultural techniques. It also means that a lot of the tidal rivers have been impacted through the construction of tidal barriers, culverts and causeways. But this creates a scenario where we have much of the land that's behind the dike, which is at lower um, subsidence. And so we have lower elevations behind the dikes than in front, which causes scenarios for, for heavy flooding, which, which is quite common in these dike line areas. And the Isthmus area, which is the narrow stretch of land that connects Nova Scotia with New Brunswick, has been identified as one of the two most vulnerable areas to climate change in the continent. Um, the disruption, you, what you see in that CN rail photo, that's a high tide photo. Um, the CN rail effectively provides the dike that protects the Trans-Canada Highway, and it has been estimated that disruption of the transportation corridor would result in losses of about $50 million of, of trade a day. So currently we've got 364 kilometers of dikes in the Bay of Fundy that protects about 80,000 hectares of low-lying low -lying land. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Bay of Fundy, it makes it has some unique challenges because we have a it's a hypertidal estuary ranging from six meters in the lower part of the bay to about 16 meters and up in the minus basin, uh, and it also has highly variable suspended sediment concentration ranging from about 20 milligrams per liter to 70,000 milligrams per liter. This has can have a significant impact on the operations of aguato structures and excessive siltation can be a challenge that needs to be considered when we're looking at any of our structures. In addition, we have a lot of ephemeral ice, uh, very large ice blocks that move within the estuary that become stranded on marsh surfaces. They become stranded within uh, tide channels and also impact 
can impact the operations of Abwato structure. In addition, there has been more recent uh, calls for the removal of many of the tidal, tidal cell system. And there was a question last uh, in the last seminar about have there been areas where gates have been removed that provide flood control? Uh, and I just, I'm not gonna speak detail about it, but on the, on the bottom right, the Petakodiak River would be an example where uh, gates were removed to restore the fish passage. And uh, there's lots of information available online about that. But there's also an uncertainty about the equilibrium state as we have what you're looking at on the left-hand side, this is the Windsor, uh, the Windsor Causeway, of salt marsh that developed downstream of this, um, and that creates a new equ equilibrium and removing structures, um, it's, they're not all equal. And so we have to make sure that when we are considering removal or modification of structures, that we look at the site-specific characteristics um, that occur in those particular areas. Now, I'm very fortunate to have worked for the last two decades with a uh, consulting firm, CB Wetlands Environmental Specialists, uh, in strong collaboration. And a lot of the work that um, we have done collaboratively, 17 different projects working mostly as compensation with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, but also through now more recently the Department of the Department of Agriculture. But we've restored about 330 hectares and have about 110 pending projects. And these range from culvert replacements to dike breaching. But one of the things that's been really great about this long-term relationship is that we have, and the support with the compensation project, is that we have long-term monitoring data. Um, all, of, all of these sites have one pre and uh, then five years post restoration in key categories. Um, and we have, it's a modification of the GPAC protocol. Uh, but it means that we have standardized um, data, data collection. Uh, we have additional, more complex sites. We'll do hydrodynamic modeling. Um, as well as uh, measurements of flow velocity. More recently, as we're starting to deal more with um, older cultural landscapes, we have to incorporate, according to the Special Places Act, um, formal archeological assessments. So that increases uh, the complexity of some of the projects that we're, we're engaged with. And so as a result of, um, we received some funding for the Coastal Restoration Fund from the Department of Fisheries Oceans and in recognition also about sort of the long standing uh, work that CB West and St. Mary's ha has done and also needs from uh, coastal, local coastal community groups for support in, um, in helping to restore coastal systems, we have established the Transcoastal Adaptation Center for Nature-Based Solutions, which has three primary pillars. One, a research and innovation section, education and outreach, and then application on the ground. So I'm gonna to speak to you some of our application uh, and also research and innovation projects that we're currently working on. So two interrelated projects that um, are working to build resilience to climate change impacts by developing a framework for implementing nature-based adaptation strategies. So this is a framework that starts from the engagement component and moving all the way through to the full monitoring and implementation. The Making Room for Wetlands project is actually the boots on the ground, actually doing the physical work, whereas the Making Room for Movement is understanding more the um, socioeconomic, sociocultural, and governance framework that impacts people's desire or not lack of desire to move. Uh, so it's, it's broader than just dike realignment, but it's really that making room for movement and how do we actually create messaging. Uh, so there, it's a unique opportunity to, to work together and we have quite a few um, academic and industry partnerships on this. And I'll be, so two of the projects for making room for wetlands would be the Belcher Street restoration, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but I will be talking about the converse uh, the Converse Marsh restoration. The Converse Marsh is located on the Missaguash River, which is the border between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick uh, in the upper, upper Bay of Fundy. This is the Chignecto Isthmus that I talked about earlier, and our transportation corridor moves along in this, in this particular direction. Uh, it's 15.4 hectares. Um, it was done in collaboration with the Department of, close collaboration with the Department of Agriculture. And in this location, we had a, uh, a new dike, which was built in the back. Here, road was, was modified and moved. Uh, material for the dike was from a borrow pit, which was on the old agricultural surfaces. 
um, and there was the dikes on the side here and all along this section were, were brought down to the level of the foreshore marsh and the Aguato, there's one outlet in the system, the Aguato was removed and brought back down, um, back down to grade. So it was breached in, uh, on the solstice, actually it was a pretty, we were, we were there as the new waters kind of came in um, and uh, it, the picture that you see here is about a year and a bit um, past post restoration. It was a very complex project because it had the um, archaeology, which resulted in a lot of design modifications and iterative processes about where we actually could put the in, 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 um, initial footprint. And there's comprehensive monitoring in, and research. One of the things that's critical when restoring the actual um, system itself is making sure the hydrology is, is correct. We are challenged in the upper Bay of Fundy because we don't have long-term tide gauges. We don't have a real-time tide gauge. So we have to rely on predictions. Uh, predictions are just that, they're predictions. They don't reflect the atmospheric and meteorological conditions. And so we also have to then try to correlate um, where water is actually coming in and how far it actually, actually goes. So this is um, validating the predicted uh, flood extents with RTK high precision GPS on, on site. And from the first breach, we were measuring suspended sediment concentrations and velocity. We also are monitoring the evolution of tidal wetland habitat. So there's a variety of research programs and uh, graduate students and undergraduate students conducting research. We use a lot of, of drones to create uh, three-dimensional surface models so we can get a sense of uh, the recovery and the evolution, for example, of, of the creek systems in the boreal pits, as well as habitat recovery and sediment elevation cha changes. And so what we're seeing at this site is we have very rapid, um, we've got rapid sedimentation in, in the boreal pits and covering of the agricultural, former agricultural surface, uh, but we, we aren't seeing as much um, vegetative recovery um, yet. Part of the project is also increasing capacity um, through training and uh, applying technology. Uh, and so this is uh, an image from the Winter One uh, and also the DJI Phantom 4 RTK um, remotely piloted system. And this allows us to once again model and trace the evolution of these creek, creek networks. We're also able to um, use another instrument here, which is a, basically an ADCP that's towed behind a kayak to look at cross-sectional discharge and quantify discharge and get a better sense of where waters are, how waters are moving through the, uh, the breach structure. And what's interesting, particularly on that, the outgoing ebb tide is um, it's really the, the channel itself is, is really split in half where we end up having the higher velocities so this is looking going out of the system. The higher velocities really um, uh, almost up and in some cases over a meter a second leaving, but only on one half of the channel. And so that's causing some interesting responses on the, on the other side. Uh, the one, the, the, actually the most complex one, which is going to be uh, pending this, this summer, this has been a project that's been in the works for, for quite some time now, quite a, about three years. And it was result um, initially of a CBCL flood report that identified that, um, that was addressing flood risk within the town of Truro and identified that opening up the floodplain, so through managed realignment in, in some areas uh, can have an impact on reduction of the flood risk within Truro. So this project was born um, as a collabor collaboration between the Departments of Agriculture, Transportation, Infrastructure, Renewal, so a compensation project, and Nova Scotia Environment, um, as well as CB West, Environmental Specialists, and ourselves to um, design a restoration project. So this did also have the application of um, Dell 3D modeling um, run by Ryan Mulligan at Queen's University. So in this uh, scenario, this is a complex one, we have to deal with CN Rail, uh, also Nova Scotia Power. This will result in the removal of three uh, Aboto structures, a modification of uh, one closer to CN Rail, and the construction of a new uh, inner, inner dike. The dikes here are gonna be flattened down to the level of the four, foreshore marsh, and I draw, uh, more details of this is actually published in the OECD um, as a case study for climate change uh, in responding to rising seas. 
The site is complex in terms of hydrodynamics. Uh, this is the area where we have about 70, uh, 70 grams per liter. Uh, so that's about four centimeters of mud that deposits per tide, but it's seasonally variable. And the bed level of the river itself can change, uh, can change quite significantly by several meters uh, seasonally. So that makes it complicated to understand the dynamics. Plus uh, this area also has experiences ice jams and we're hoping that part of the result of this project will result in a ice parking lot, shall we say. So this is an aerial, an oblique aerial view of the actual, of the actual inner dike and borrow pit. And the McCurdy's Brook that I noticed that I mentioned you earlier on, um, this is actually a couple of weeks ago, fish actually wanted to go up. Um, so responding to that freshwater signal and really waiting um, for those gates to come off. So it'll be very interesting to see how the system responds, the reintroduction of fish, and uh, Bob uh, has more experience in that. But what we can see here is the, the ditches, but these will end up being incorporated within, um, into a hybrid Relic Creek network that will allow um, the flow of water, fish, as well as sediments and recolonization into the back sections of, of the marsh. It'll also have a comprehensive uh, enhanced monitoring and research project and also serve as a demonstration project as well. Um, but with that being said, if I'm welcome to answer any questions, I would love to have more collaborations. It's great to see other people working in Dykeland systems. And this is a photo last August. Um, in that earlier picture of me kayaking, I'm in the inner part of the site. I was doing velocity measurements and suddenly shorebirds just started arriving. And so I just let myself settle onto the newly formed mud flat and it was, magical because what what seemed to be lack of life all this you know stinking mud was so full of life and it was really transformative for all of our team and and, and some of actually some media folks that were there at the time that um, the life was actually returning so that was that was pretty cool so thank you and also acknowledging this work cannot be done without all of our students at saint mary's university um, as well as colleagues at CP Wetlands Environmental Specialists and the Department of Agriculture and Transportation Renewal. Thank you. Thanks so much, Danica. Yeah, it's, uh, you guys are doing some amazing work over there. So glad that you were able to join us today. Thanks. Sure. Very happy to share. Um, with that, I will uh, hand it over to Bob Rutherford uh, to uh, get his presentation ready, share his screen. So Bob is currently the president and senior aquatic habitat restoration biologist with Thomas Environmental Consultants and chair of the Nova Scotia Salmon Association's field programs committee. He spent 30 years with DFO under a few different positions, notably as head of integrated oceans and coastal management, regional representative on the National Oceans Policy Committee, and Chief of Habitat Planning with ex special expertise in fish passage research and fish migration behavior. Over to you, Bob. Oh, and let me just unmute you. Oh yes, where did my- There we go, I got gotcha. you. You got me? Yeah, we can Good. hear you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> uh, and it fills the whole screen. I can't see that mute button anymore. Yeah. Um, Danica, a great introduction and I'm just going to talk about one uh, site on the Minas Basin and the southern bite of the Minas Basin uh, where the causeway and Abido washed out and uh, we are uh, it has been rebuilt so we'll see how that goes. This is the southern part of the uh, Minas Basin right here Danica's work has been up along the other shore and over in Truro in this area. This site uh, has a railway causeway across it. And you can see here how the, the turbid tide on the outside and the river on the inside. This is a CBOS shot. And uh, all the brown area in here is area that would be flooded if the uh, causeway was completely open and they're sampling sites they're doing the same sort of work. They're doing the same work here as they're doing on the other sites that Danica spoke about. This is a Google shot of the same place. You see the rail line causeway here across the tide. 
uh, across the tidal flats. Um, we had farmland here. Uh, now that uh, we're opening up or partially opening up the uh, causeway dike here, uh, this will all become uh, wetland salt marsh. So originally this uh, causeway was uh, built with a timber abido, it was completed in 1869, it was rebuilt in 1912, and it's been maintained over the years by various owners of the line. Uh, several rail line companies have owned it. But with the economic downturn in 2008, the line was no longer in use and they did minimal maintenance. I don't think they did any maintenance on the Abido itself. And uh, the line was listed for sale in 2013 and sold to a company in Virginia. And that sale has taken many, many years to complete. And the absentee owner of the line is not in use. The timber Abido was failing. Um, and first one gate fell off and then the second gate uh, was damaged and partially off. And in 2017, it washed out. And the opening continued to erode and was affecting infrastructure and flooding in areas upstream. Now our hope was that we could just leave it wide open and clean up the, the opening in the causeway and restore that to a, a natural level and then get to regain the uh, tidal wetlands upstream. But there were some infrastructure issues uh, with the bridge and road immediately upstream and uh, some er bank erosion, some at a, a, an old cemetery. So uh, CB West, St. Mary's U and Transcoastal began studying the wetland recovery with the, the dike washed out. A Mi'kmaq Conservation Group with Acadia University began studying the fish recovery in the uh, area in the estuary and the river. But there was a lot of public pressure and uh, mounted because of the flooding and erosion upstream. So there was a political decision was made to replace the ca causeway and put in two boxed culverts to control the tidal levels and provide free fish passage. This was paid for by the province, but that's before the courts are trying to get the rail line owner to, to pay and own the new structure. Both of the studies are continuing, but DFO issued an authorization for the uh, putting in the culverts and the replacement of the, the causeway. And that authorization uh, from the federal government uh, requires a study on the effectiveness and efficiency of fish passage. And that's what we're working on. So this is what it looked like when it washed out in 2017. Not a very big opening, but you can see some of the timber piles of the, the structure. But by 2018, it had really washed out. You can see the three barrels of the, the old timber uh, uh, pipe and cabido and the old rail lines here still across. But there was flooding upstream on the bridge up above. and. Uh, that uh, created a lot of public concern. So in 2019, the province started to rebuild. They put in these two concrete box culverts. They're about 54 meters long. And uh, it sort of worked, but uh, there was a lot of erosion on the downstream and upstream side. And this destabilized the culverts. And so work had to be redone in uh, 2020 to rebuild the site and stabilize everything. So now we have a lot of structure on the downstream side and a lot of rock and a lot of stabilizing materials. So these cement blocks all wired together here uh, to keep erosion away. See how it's all infilled over the uh, tidal flats there. But you can see here how they, uh, at low tide, we have a river that runs out across the tidal flats. So we're not really at the low tide level, we're uh, part way up the tide. And this is what the upstream side looks like uh, now with all the extra riprap and rock on the, uh, the tidal area there and the river coming down through. So taking a look at this on a tidal cycle, this was in May this year. Uh, we had a 12.9 meter tide that day. That's not the biggest tide that we get there. 
Uh, it can be uh, four meters higher than that. But uh, during these are the levels of the culvert bottom and the culvert top. And during low tide, this period, we have that river running out across the tidal flats. Then we have water, salt water running upstream as the culvert fills and continuing to run upstream during the tide coming in and the tide starting to drop. And this is the high the tide level got on the upstream side. So about two meters lower than the, uh, the tide would have been had the uh, causeway not been there. And at times on a high, high tide and a storm surge, that can be as much as five or five and a half meters difference between the, the high tide here and the tide on the upstream side. So it is having quite an effect on controlling the level of the tide upstream. But as this tide falls and the water is going back out through the culvert, we get very high velocities and uh, the velocities drop off as we get down to the river flow and back to low tide. So we have five stages here that we've got to look at the fish passage. Now, when the tide is just above the culverts on the, on the tidal side, we get these gyres forming and the water is circulating on this side in a clockwise way, this side a counterclockwise way. It's very disorienting for any migrating fish. And they tend to be fairly close to the surface in this turbid water. So there's, they become up above uh, the culverts and can't find it. We have a lot of high velocities and turbulence up above. So the fish that do come through tend to, uh, it appears as though they're getting banged against some of the rocks and getting uh, thrown around in the turbulent water and injured. So when the tide is full, it looks like this on the upstream, on the downstream side. On the upstream side, we do have some uh, upwelling well back in the, the uh, river. Uh, but it's still very confusing circulating patterns here that get the fish going around in circles that come through. As the tide falls, we get a real strong gyre on the upstream side, clockwise gyre here, uh, which spins the fish around, but incredible turbulence on the downstream side. And when I showed you the low tide picture, there's a lot of rock and uh, material there that they're bounced around in. So back to the low tide, you can see all the rock and so on that's under all that turbulence as the, the river drains out and the slow tide back upstream again. So it's quite, as though it was supposed to be free fish passage, it is quite a challenging place uh, to assess the fish passage. The, uh, it's very deep in turbid water, very high velocities, disorienting gyres and turbulence. But there's an interest in the wide range of species as well, from very small stickleback uh, to sea run brook trout, Atlantic salmon, striped bass, American eels, and tomcod, um, and the marine species that live there. Interest is from DFO, the First Nations, and the public. We have anadromous fish, catadromous eels, um, Gary Hayline fish that live in the brackish water, and marine species all moving back and forth or trying to through this, through this site. So we can and model the passage in the culverts, but DFO wants actual numbers and estimates of the fish passage by species. And we're not sure how to do that or address what happens with the fish migration behavior and the turbulence and gyres. So the studies are ongoing, led by CBUS on the wetland habitat development above, although not quite as much as flooded as had it been open, completely open. We're still going to have a lot of salt marsh habitat there. And the uh, fish studies are still led by Mi'kmaq Conservation and uh, Acadia University. So by next Wednesday, I need a fish passage assessment plan. So if anybody's got any great ideas of how I assess in that situation, I'd like to know them. And that's all. That's great, thanks, Bob. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear the, the difference in the challenge in, in Nova Scotia with the tides and um, Stan Nick was mentioning the sediments. Completely different um, types of solutions going on. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm seeing we've, we are having a, uh, quite a few questions pouring in on Slido. Um, a lot of them are directed at Bob. So I'm also wondering if Bob, you would mind um, replying to those in the Slido itself. We can also do that at the end, but uh, I'd hope to get some more questions that are a bit more general for our whole panel of, of folks. Um, so some of them are a bit more specific. They could even be answered in chat potentially. So Bob, if you don't mind navigating your way over to the Slido, uh, or mm. <laughs> I can pop a link. I'm not in it right now, but yeah. Yeah. And there is a way to answer those questions too. Or for the folks that are asking Bob questions, they could also pop it into the chat too. You, you could, or you could give them my email too if you want, and I can answer them yeah, uh, maybe later if there's quite a few. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so please do. Otherwise, you'll be forced to listen to my not so great questions um, that are probably a bit more general as well. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Lynn. Alex, uh, and Carrie, as she gets her presentation set up, is a fisheries biologist and fluvial geomorphologist working with Okanagan Nation Alliance since 2002. She's a BCIT FWR grad, like me, uh, a UVic uh, Bachelor of Science grad in fluvial geomorphology and did her master's degree through the Canadian Rivers Institute at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, her master's looked at how flow parameters impact spawning sockeye salmon and has been doing a lot of amazing different projects with the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Thanks for being here, Carrie. Oh, thank you for thank you for the invite. Um, so yeah, so we have um, we really focused with the Okanagan Nation Alliance, which has a uh, an alliance of the seven member bands, um, and we have a fisheries department. Um, and within the fisheries department, we were given some pretty strong guidance from the elders of the Okanagan Nation, as well as the traditional ecological knowledge keepers, which are not always elders. Those are sometimes families that have passed down information um, to other families, to, through their families, um, on uh, river restoration. So we started with a lot of river restoration projects uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, and we've um, uh, also done, um, we've, more recently, we've done a lot of dike breaches and uh, dike setbacks as well. So I'm just going to go through uh, what we learned from all of the projects because they, we definitely didn't nail it on the first go round um, and uh, how we're dealing with them. So just for us a little bit of background because I'm going to take you from all these great coastal presentations uh, inland. And uh, so the Okanagan River flows into the Columbia River and it is a desert ecosystem primarily. And we do have salmon coming back to this desert ecosystem. We also have a series of uh, lakes that are all managed. Um, they're not reservoirs, they're all natural lakes that are just um, highly regulated. And the reasons that the dams um, and, the alter and the negative alterations to the river uh, relate to a lot of flooding that occurred, um, as well as trying to take this desert ecosystem and grow uh, orchards and vineyards on it, so a lot of water withdrawal. Uh, so we've had a lot of dams, a lot of dredging, uh, and a lot of channelization uh, throughout the river. In fact, probably about of the 84 percent of the river was channelized. Only three kilometers remain in its natural setting, um, and another three, almost three kilometers, is a sort of a setback dike. Uh, and that was done in the 1950s. The rest of it has been fully channelized. We're a very narrow valley, so all of the um, people and the agriculture and everything occurs right next to the river. So we're, it's a lot of high demand land at the bottom. It goes very um, uh, valley bottom and then uh, steep sided uh, bedrock canyons and then we have uh, high elevation plateaued uh, uh, highland areas. So that is some of our issues. So uh, we were, again, through the guidance from the Okanagan Nation elders and what I'm gonna call tech, traditional ecological knowledge keeper committees, we were given a number of um, tasks. One of them was to put the river back. The other was to put the fish back in the river. Uh, and it came with a lot of uh, details of how to, um, how we should probably start looking into that. Uh, and so the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative was 
born of that 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, this piece of property was purchased, as you can see on the, on the video, uh, or on the, on the screen before you. Uh, and we went about to set that dike back uh, and then re-meander within the, within the dike setback. So the dike is actually about, the dike setback is about a kilometer long. Uh, the re-meander is about half of that. And then I'm going to talk about a side channel reconnection on this side. So you can see the river sort of came over the side channel, re meandered through here um, uh, and, uh, and out. So we, the old dike sitting where you can see the scar of the old dike, that um, just, we just had to cut it out. We just had to cut those sections out um, and stabilize them uh, for, uh, for um, to, to be able to sort of move the river and see if we can kind of access more habitat. The river as it stands channelized is amazingly great habitat for the 13 and exotic fish species that don't belong here. They also don't do well with floodplain. They don't, they don't mix well with floodplain species. So we have things like largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, carp, um, yellow perch. Uh, and when those fish get into the floodplain, uh, they have a tendency to stay in hot, dry weather. Uh, and eat the amphibians and the timing of when the amphibians are coming out in the in the spring and summer. The indigenous fish that we have here don't have that issue. So we have rainbow trout uh, and kokanee is resident uh, indigenous fish species um, as well as uh, three anadromous fish species. One coho has been extirpated but we still have returns of chinook, sockeye and uh, steelhead in the spring. Those fish species, uh, particularly the steelhead and the chinook, will use these floodplain uh, areas and access them, and then they'll they'll migrate back um, into the river after, as the spring spring freshet. They don't overlap with the amphibians, and so it ends up being a happier combination. So we really had to deal with our current situation, which included um, exotic uh, these exotic fish species. So the project, that first project was done in 2008 and 2009, and that's what it sort of looks like more recently. So a lot better vegetation. We have a gravel bar movements within the system. Um, so the dike setback has worked very, very successfully there. Uh, we found since we've reestablished energy in that area, uh, sockeye are now spawning in this restored section where they weren't before. Chinook are spawning uh, also in the area. Then we moved a little bit upstream uh, and we tried to, or we built a side channel reconnection. This was an old piece of the river that we connected as a side channel. Our connections were bridges. So we actually breached the dikes here in the two places at the top of the screen near the riffle and at the bottom of the screen and, um, and had it free flowing. The original goal was to have it free, free flowing for all, at all points um, of the year. So it would be a small side channel all year round. What we discovered though, and it, it, worked, it works great in the spring, um, is the construction. It's a fabulous uh, water quality refugia as water kind of gets cleared out and then um, returns back to the murky water uh, in the spring. So it works great in the spring. However, for uh, the rest of the year, we found that it kind of had filled in. Um, what we discovered from all of this is that it actually is the best thing for us. Um, the we end up having anoxic conditions uh, in the side channel in the um, in the summer months and what we really really want is only that side channel to really be um, effective in the spring in high water and it, it it still maintains itself effective in high water we want this because we want the chinook that are spawning upstream of this area to be able to utilize this off-channel habitat which chinook need the vegetation um, from these floodplain areas because it feeds different invertebrate communities that increases their growth. So Chinook that can hold in these um, lower velocity areas uh, do can double their growth and the, we're assuming that it improves their survival. We also want them to sort of move out as the waters recede we've discovered and not hang around which is what we were finding before because we need them to get out the 1,200 kilometers from the Okanagan to the ocean. And we need them to start that early because otherwise they get stuck with a thermal um, barrier down in the uh, mid and lower Columbia River that impedes their survival. So we've also discovered that we really want these dike and dam breaches, uh, dike breaches to exist for these floodplain type scenarios and not um, uh, all year round. Uh, on the far side of the same property that we had purchased um, 20 years ago, um, where the dike was set back, so the old dike, you can kind of almost see the scar, 
Uh, and then the new dike is definitely very uh, present. Uh, there's the side channel on the uh, far side where all the um, fall cottonwoods are looking beautifully yellow. Uh, we notched this and the engineers at the time were very conservative and they notched it. We thought we would get a little bit more water in this in this back area than we um, ended up being able to get. Um, and otherwise, for most of this flood, for this setback date, all the vegetation was on its own. The vegetation, we did do some plantings, but really the plantings that came up on its own were um, were the strongest uh, and were the fastest. Uh, all we needed to do is maintain, uh, keep down uh, some of the invasive plants uh, that were happening in the area. So we ended up going back into this floodplain on the far side um, just recently and notching it lower to get more water into these back areas. Um, and again, to make a different kind of, but spring refugia for Chinook. Um, the other species that the elders have really been sort of pushing us towards is um, looking at connections between Chinook and cottonwood. Chinook populations have declined. Cottonwood populations have also declined. These dikes are 50 years old. The um, cottonwoods that we mostly see are also 50 years old or older. So we're not getting a lot of uh, regrowth of cottonwood. So this floodplain was meant to sort of um, try and study and see if we can understand, since we've lost all these floodplain uh, reconnections, or the bulk of them with the channelization, how to understand what the cottonwoods, the play between the cottonwoods and the Chinook and what they both need. This floodplain inundation was designed also only to be um, flooded in the spring for Chinook, but only to be flooded at a certain elevation so that the cottonwoods would be sort of um, uh, be able to regenerate. So we needed them so that even in low water, the cottonwood seedlings would be only a meter from groundwater. And that is because that is how fast their roots can grow when we modeled it uh, to how a cotton, how fast the root could grow uh, on a cottonwood and how, how fast the, um, the water would move down in the spring after a, a typical freshet, an average freshet. So we tried to model it to make sure that those, all those connections um, were created uh, so, and then we're hoping to sort of monitor this situation to see how the play, interplay between Chinook and uh, Cottonwood um, continue to, to grow. Moving a little bit upstream now, um, uh, another recent uh, change sort of moving now towards uh, Penticton, it's sort of the northern part of uh, the Okanagan River. Uh, that, this whole section of river in Penticton was completely channelized. It went from eight kilometers to six kilometers and all channelized and all of the spawning areas were removed. When fish were returned, which is another one of our projects is a sockeye reintroduction to the area, we had to create these spawning beds. And so spawning beds were built um, from the dam down. The issue we have here is the fact that because it's a dammed system um, at the headwaters and this whole area of Penticton was all really marsh, um, and wetland, and now it's got people and lots of other bits and pieces going on, that um, it, we've lost about uh, the groundwater and the lake levels are, are in the dam below this dam are about two meters to three meters lower than what they used to be. So now to get any floodplain inundation, all of those areas would have normally been flooded, but because the dam takes up the head difference, we have to actually dig. We have to dig to get anything um, down get down to water in a floodplain reconnection. So once these spawning beds were created, they're created for Chinook, sockeye, uh, steelhead, rainbow trout, and kokanee. There's different parameters uh, for gravel, depths, and velocities that exist at all of them. We identified that we needed something downstream for particularly for Chinook or steelhead to be able to use as a floodplain inundation. And in partnership with the Penticton Indian Band and with the Analkin Learning Center, who purchased the property where the star is, um, we started digging a big pit. Um, and so we have dug uh, an, a, a massive um, wetland reconnection project uh, this last March. Um, and we are looking to put in box culverts uh, to have it connected. So this would be an off-channel habitat. Um, this is different from the other two. This one will actually have water a little bit longer, but it will still want, um, it'll still need to go dry. It still needs the Chinook to get out of the system so that they can get down the lower Columbia and to the ocean before the thermal um, uh, uh, blocks happen on the Columbia River and even into the Okanagan River because it is so hot here. 
um, as well as um, providing, uh, there's flattened uh, areas for uh, cottonwood meadows to establish and again, trying to learn from what they need for their, uh, their growth of the juvenile cottonwoods. And there's a few amphibian ponds that are isolated from this fish bearing pond that um, do feed off of the pond for just for water, um, water inundation that we've sort of dug down to. So that um, concludes my presentation. Um, it has, uh, we feel like we have been very, very lucky um, that we've had a very consistent group of fisheries biologists and geomorphologists that have been around to raise their families here. So they seem to stay put um, and can kind of follow and monitor these projects. Super lucky to have uh, these elder groups and tech uh, groups that can uh, have provided guidance for all of our projects, as well as the Okanagan River Restoration has a steering committee, which also includes multiple, multiple partners, a lot of collaboration, um, and a lot of positive uh, discussion on how to solve some of the problems that we've created with colonization um, of our waterways, as well as colonization of our Indigenous um, groups. Uh, so with that, I will, um, uh, I will sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That's really great work. Um, and I'm just really amazed by all, all the great work that uh, everyone, every one of our presenters is doing. Uh, and thanks so much for being here today. Uh, with that, we're gonna get into the question round. So if you are not on Slido yet, this is the time to head over there. Uh, you can join at slido.com and put in the event tag salmon. Um, there has been a few uh, questions directed to Bob, and he's answered a few of them in the chat already, but uh, let's start. It's basically going by vote, so if you like a question that's there, vote it up. If you uh, would like to see a different uh, question, then write it in. Um, if you have like a multi-part question and the, the space restriction is stopping you, then just uh, see if you can phase it as two different questions. Um, so with that, I think this is directed to Danica, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, top question is any, oh, okay, we're still gonna stick with this one. Any additional marsh restoration projects uh, on the horizon to carry on with flood mitigation? Uh, speaks to the ability to manage floods more naturally with better planning. So the projects that we have right now, um, they're in the monitoring phase. There are discussions for some additional additional work, but the actual sites um, have not been selected at this time. But the integration of uh, managed realignment uh, is something that is being considered within the Dykeland as one of the options to respond to some of the challenges of climate change. But right now, um, we don't have any additional sites that have been identified. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on that? Comments on marsh restoration? Okay, we'll move on to this more, um, a more general question here, um, which Jillian uh, put into chat. Uh, what were the biggest barriers to your work and how did you navigate policy barriers or business as usual attitudes to make your work happen? I can start on that one. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's some of it for particularly for these larger managed realignment projects. It's navigating a bit of uncertain waters where this is not something that has been uh, is very visible or people have done within the within the area. So challenges with regards to navigating um, archaeology uh, and also challenges with uh, with navigating uh, people's perceptions about what uh, what would happen when we actually remove a particular a particular dike infrastructure and how those barriers or policy barriers things have been overcome was and uh, we actually have a paper that was led by my postdoc to do Raman and sustainability um, it's basically innovative institutional actors. So people in departments, so key people in, so key players in Department of Agriculture, Transportation and Environment, um, and also the really 
a long-term relationship between an academic sector and the private academic and private sector makes for people stepping a little bit outside of their box and having conversations um, that and not remaining with their ind individual silos that has been challenged uh, challenging um, but on the other hand i think it's allowed us to move forward in ways that um, can't be done with an, with an individual, at least in the Nova Scotian context, with an individual departmental framework. Thanks, Danica. Uh, can anybody else with some ideas on that? Um, I can weigh in a little yeah, bit in, in our particular situation. So um, there was a lot of um, public and policy and government-based concepts when we brought this idea of setting rivers back to where they used to be um, uh, from an elder's perspective and then that was that was safe that that was unsafe for the public they, they felt like these rivers were there for a purpose and they were like the way they were for a purpose um, and trying to communicate effectively that you know sometimes 1950s engineering um, is not necessarily the the best solution for today so um, I would suggest communication so we have a an amazing communications lead. Um, she does a lot of public outreach. She uh, has a, a open line, and during certain times of the projects, she will um, it's she'll have it on seven days a week, and people can call her, log questions. She logs it out to any of the steering committee and logs back. So there was it was a very constant message and a consistent messaging. And we have fact sheets that also made a constant and consistent messaging. So for people that agreed with the projects, that was great. For people that didn't agree with the projects. We did what we said we were going to do when we said we were going to do it and they were still they felt comfort in that even though they weren't necessarily comfortable with setting these dikes back in, uh, in when they had seen them over time because we've done a series of these projects and we were also um sort of guided by the elders to put people back so they said put the fish back put the rivers back and put people back so they wanted us to make these projects so that people fit back in them in certain ways and people felt comfortable with the river being a river again. We're very risk averse when it comes to rivers because we, we don't seem to have a, enough of a mentality to understand that they change in a year. They change all the time. There's a rate of change, in fact, and we have to allow for a certain amount of rate of change. The elder guidance that we have is very, very clear on what is a, a, what is a reasonable rate of change and what is now an unreasonable rate of change. So us in our designs, we're always trying to fill that, but um, it was also to communicate this idea that there is a rate of, there's a reasonable rate of change. The last thing I'm gonna add is collaboration. So the steering committee is very vast and very diverse. Um, and it took 10 years for the steering committee to do the first project, the second project took three, and now they're turning around these projects in a year, year and a half tops because they, work together, they continue to work together. We all know what each other's issues are before we even get to the table. So we're, we're able to identify um, the, the flood control, uh, the people responsible for flood control, we know what they, what they need and we're not trying to fight with them, we're trying to work with them. So I think that collaboration and communication um, and those elements were pretty key for us. Thank you. Thanks, Gary Lynn, great answers. Uh, Bob or Jenna, do you wanna weigh in? on biggest barriers to, to work? Uh, there, a lot of these projects take such a long time to develop when we're dealing with these large barriers. And uh, the planning stage takes a long time and we have so many different uh, interests in the public. Some people want to keep them there and we want to open them up and get the wetlands back and the fish moving again. And uh, it becomes a, a media event and a Facebook event. And I think that's, uh, becoming quite a challenge now with all these different opinions showing up on social media. And these people aren't all on a steering committee or something that we can deal with. It's, it's the public, so. All right. Yeah, Jenna, did you wanna add something? Oh, let me unmute you here, there we go. Let's take a second. Uh, still mute. There we go. We got you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, I would just like to say that um, I think it's finding the people willing to roll up their sleeves and work for common goals is still a challenge in the Skagit. Um, and, so, and so until we can kind of overcome that hurdle 
um, and agree to share the space. Uh, it's just difficult to get along, um, but but I'm hopeful that we'll get get there as a community and maybe have some of these things that you were talking about, Carolyn, where where people are realizing. Uh, we can't escape our history, but we can change the path of the future and we need to work together for that. Um, and that's, um, I, I'm hopeful more than anything else that that's where, where we can get in this gadget. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really struck kind of by the, by the poetry of it that uh, we're working on, on flood control and, and barriers to fish passage and so much of that work is about removing our own cultural barriers and, and opening those barriers of communication that like uh, Bob alluded to, like things like social media are ingraining us more and more in our bubble. So these are, these are challenging, challenging times and we have to, to work on on breaking those barriers down between ourselves. Um, yeah, great answers, everyone. Uh, I'll add, uh, go to the next question. What policy changes would you recommend to see more projects like the ones you guys are featuring? And maybe I'll broaden that out a little bit. So I think you have spoken a little bit to solutions already. Um, well, maybe let's keep it with policy. And if you want to broaden it out to other kinds of solutions and please do. Um. Um, I'll just weigh in quick. Um, so some things that really limit us uh, and from an ONA perspective as well is that I think, uh, and there is some changes in the Federal Fisheries Act that look at providing indigenous input into projects. I think that's hugely valuable. I think we're just lucky that we we're so well connected um, here that we were able to access um, information that provided very interesting concepts of what we were really should be focusing on. Um, so having more um, indigenous participation in projects, I think, is um, is very important. Uh, what we struggle with is that most of these projects are grant based and they're very hit it and quit it. So you are constantly trying to figure out how to checkbox um, within one year exactly what one group wants to do, but none of these projects take one uh, funding source. They take multiple funding sources. That's very, very difficult. We were also very lucky in getting uh, some monitoring funds from a US group for uh, five years. It was a small fund, but we were able to sort of apply it over five years. Um, and that really made projects turn around quickly for us because we could answer questions for the steering committee by monitoring the data we needed to monitor to make it effective. So it, it not, we hope, we're hoping it makes the project effective as well, but it was providing information to, to the steering committee for the next, like constantly working on the next project, the next project, the next project. So um, having uh, a policy change and a lot of funding that brings monitoring back um, for those types of reasons would be really, um, I'd see a lot of utility in that. But most grants are, are very monitoring adverse. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Gary-Lynn. Yeah, I, I think for us, um, coming from the flood protection side of it would be policies in place, like you said, for the complicated um, funding strategies, a lot of the projects, restoration projects that go on the ground that have infrastructure elements are, um, there's no policy that requires um, the flood protection infrastructure to go back um, in a way that's uh, sort of uh, aware of and designed for climate change or changing scenarios. So we also work in really dynamic systems and all the funding, um, there's no way to match the funding. And so what we're experiencing a lot is the salmon funding goes towards these great habitat projects, but there's no real incentive to uh, bring the rest of us along. So we often get um, infrastructure that's as good or maybe not quite as good as what we had. Um, and then if we ask for more, ask that our needs are also met, uh, we become sort of project opposers, which isn't the case. It's just that we have these huge responsibilities um, that we also have to see met on projects. And so any policies that would help facilitate partnerships would would help tremendously with with us being able to participate. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, Bob or Danica, do you want to weigh in on this one? Well, there are conflicting policy directives as well. Um, there, 
interest in keeping the farmland uh, up above these dikes. There's interest in um, development and so on that conflict with the Fisheries Act policy. How you make them all work together, it would be good if uh, they came up with a, a policy of exactly what we're going to do on these dikes in the, in the uh, Bay of Fundy. Um, what we can open, what we can't. What we have is a series of individual policies and uh, you have all those different players coming together. And sometimes they're making decisions, the policy is there, but they're making decisions based on site specific conditions. So you never really know what answer you're gonna get from a department. But I would also agree that the funding for uh, community groups, especially participating in this, that has to be changed. We can't see changes in the funding programs uh, every couple of years, and you have to fit your program to whatever they're doing, uh, whatever the flavor of the day is with the government funding. Danica? Yeah, so I would just, I would echo what Bob, Bob is saying um, and many of the others with regards to um, con con conflicts with policies and jurisdictions about who has, you know, jurisdictions for the dikes and the maintenance, the land behind it. In our area, we've also got the Agricultural Marshlands Act. Um, so there are marsh bodies that are actually involved, which makes it challenging um, sometimes to navigate all those different players as well as to um, yes, navigate kind of conflicting policies, um, but also budgetary constraints within departments that are responsible for uh, some of some of these different projects. But then also constraints for some of the funding sources um, that you can't match with, let's say, compensation dollars, for example. That becomes that can becomes a barrier if the uh, the funding source does not allow you to purchase land you can't use compensation funding to purchase land to allow a project to go forward. So that does, uh, there are challenges along that, along those lines. All right, yeah, thanks very much. Um, here's one just, just for Bob and maybe Danica can weigh in on it as well. How is the government able to install the structure from a legal st standpoint without the rail line owners involvement? A uh, simple answer to that was it was a political decision um, and they did it and now they're trying to get the uh, the owner to pay for it and take ownership of it. It's because it was causing problems with the uh, some of the infrastructure, the road infrastructure up above and there was a public, a lot of public concern and the local politician, the politicians just made the decision and Actually, it was uh, being discussed at the time, and it was a surprise to everybody when the, it was announced. <laughs> yeah, Danica, do you have anything to add to that, or is that the whole story? I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, there you go. A lot of different ways of approaching a problem, I guess. And I think this question may have come up last week about... Um, yeah, what moved a, a certain structure along and what invoked a piece of regulation. Maybe that was a different structure. I'm getting mixed up, maybe. Yeah, so, from a legal standpoint, though, it's, uh, it was just considered an emergency thing and something that the politicians can make changes when they want to. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm going to end us with the question of uh, what would you like to see change in our flood mitigation techniques in the next 50 years? Um, I'll add just from an Okanagan perspective, there needs to be less risk versus more resiliency in flood mitigation and not so tightly bound. Rivers are just too, river, our rivers and lakes are too tightly bound. We need to get set the people back. Uh, and let the rivers um, do what they need to do to protect us, basically, and provide for clear, clean, clear water. That was great. Thanks, Gary. I would uh, follow up with that. Is, is that's really that making room for movement, the dynamic movement of, of the coastal zone. 
But the big thing that I'd really like to see is um, a, a wider acceptance of nature-based adaptation techniques um, that can be and are being shown to be uh, very effective and, some t and have that increased resilience, but we still have a reluctance um, within the Canadian and uh, at least the Canadian engineering community of trusting that these systems can actually work. So I would love to see that fully integrated in consideration um, and you know, more living dikes, more innovative techniques that we can try. And there's always gonna be a first, um, but being wanting to be that first and having research programs that allow us to demonstrate that, that effectiveness and taking that risk. Jenna or Bob, you want to weigh in? Yeah, <laughs> now, this is a tricky one too. Uh, the, uh, the current approach is to fight the flooding, mitigate the flooding. I think we've got to uh, recognize that the rivers and the, the coastal zone is going to change and we're just going to have to back off, back out and let the flooding uh, flood the land, uh, give it space. And uh, I wanna see those changes coming more than uh, saying it's a floodplain so you're not gonna be able to get insurance sort of thing or uh, <laughs> uh, we've got a lot here in Nova Scotia. We didn't really talked about that, but the land is subsiding as well as the sea level rising very quickly. And in a bay like the Bay of Fundy, where the water funnels up and we get those very high tides, uh, we're going to see a lot of changes and we've got a lot of dikes that aren't going to survive that uh, if we leave them uh, and then the land will flood. And But uh, it's a question and it's going to be a policy issue, I guess, whether we try and raise those dikes everywhere or what we can open up and uh, let the ocean have and uh, develop the salt marshes along the edge. Uh, Jenna? Well, I don't have much to add. I think you guys really nailed it, but definitely we're going to have to come up with more innovative approaches. We also have uh, most of the 60,000 acres that we protect is subsided and below mean high tide. Certainly it's below any sort of project projection for sea level, but um, Local sustainable foods are also really important to us. We don't want to import all of our food from China um, and Southern California, Mexico, which are our other big food suppliers are um, also susceptible to climate change. So I think maybe just having a holistic conversation about how we persist or not persist on the, on the landscape would be really helpful for me. Yeah, thanks Jenna. Dan, can I just add one, yeah, one sure. quick thing? Um, one of the things that, you know, this has been a great workshop to get a chance to speak to others that that we, we haven't spoken to before, um, but initiatives in Europe, for example, the big Building with Nature Consortium has really, really uh, leveraged significant amounts of funding, but also collaboration between countries for, uh, for research and application of a lot of these nature-based techniques, and it's, they've so I think there's something that you know we can we can try to engage with those communities or come up with a community ourselves, um, a consortium that can help uh, strategize about pooling pooling different resources and targeting particular particular funding sources. Yeah, thanks, Danica, and that's a that's a big reason why we're we're kind of looking outside to see what other kinds of models we can we can look to because we can get very focused on the way we have done things or. Uh, we need to be able to look outside and, and see what, the way other people are doing things too. So thanks for that. Um, and thanks so much to all you presenters. I'm just going to do a quick little wrap up here. Um, we do have a uh, workshop on July 24th, I can confirm, uh, and it's about prioritization methods. And currently we have um, Canadian Wildlife Federation, um, Riley Finn and UBC Rain Coast, uh, Dion Buncha from Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance, and I think Jason Knuckles from uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Oregon T Tide Gates Partnership. So uh, there will be a, a link to that. I will send out a link to that to register. Um, ideas for future webinars and workshops. We heard a lot, so 
uh, if you've written them into me, I have heard them. We are looking at them. It does seem like uh, the, the idea of more policy and guidelines is is really coming up um, for us. So that may really be the next one on the list to tackle. Uh, as Danica alluded to, there's a lot of cool work going on in Europe right now. Um, so I got reached out to by some folks doing dam removal off in, uh, in Europe. And so there is a webinar. I'm just going to move my screen here so that I can grab the link to it. So if you guys are interested in this webinar in Sweden, they will be actively removing a dam while this webinar is happening. So that's cool. <laughs> They're going to be live streaming it. Um, and finally, if you all have a moment, I did not get much feedback on the last webinar. I mean, I heard some good things from people, but I did not get much in the way of uh, submissions to the Google form. So uh, that just tells you how much more impact you'll have if you do go and, and put that feedback in there. So please do uh, submit that feedback. Finally, I'd just like to thank all our presenters today. Um, Thank our funders, the Salmon Restoration Innovation Fund and Pacific Salmon Foundation. Thanks all our partners, uh, Pearson Ecological, Kerwood Lydell, our team, I should say. Um, if you have any feedback, let me know, dan at resilientwaters.ca, uh, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>